Pastor. Yes, I'm starting. Don't want an apology. You don't owe us an apology for doing what we did. Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Because if we were uh, a recipient of the conversation with you, we would appreciate you being All right. All right. Good evening once again, and welcome to Fresh Start. I'm trying my best not to date these so people can go back and watch them at whatever lesson they're on. We're about halfway through. Uh, this is lesson number 16, and we're going to go through and do some some uh, little housekeeping. This is a ministry of Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you can find us at se, the number seven day.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Roku, both the website and all of those um, outlets have recordings of what we do and live broadcasts. If you can catch the schedule, which is on se, the number seven the word day.org. This is me, Pastor Stan Hood. And next week, you're going to see the other teachers uh, see their lovely faces. But for now, we're going to go with me. And so uh, what we're studying is a special edition of Sign of the Times. It's called We Believe. It's a brief overview of the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The best place to learn about somebody is indeed the source. That's the most, most accurate information. If you're curious about what we believe uh, as a Christian community, this is the place to get it. Also, you can get this book yourself at AdventistBookCenter.com. It's fairly uh, inexpensive and they will mail it directly to you. All right, it's the start of something new. Tonight, it is Lesson 16, The Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and this look into the meaning of communion. And we ask that it bless every hearer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. So we're going to get started with an introduction. We have a volunteer to start us off on reading tonight. I'll take it on. Oh. The services. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Wait a minute. Go ahead, uh, Brother King. I think you read last time. I'll, I'll come back yeah, to you. Go ahead, Sister Regina. The services in the ancient Israelites sanctuary pointed forward to the Messiah who was to come and his ministry and death. Similar similarly, the Lord's Supper commemorates the death of Jesus and calls the believer's attention to promise of his second coming. All right. So we're going to pause right here. Just stand by, Sister Regina. We're going to pause right here. And uh, we're going to take a second just to get two or three people to share, if you don't mind, uh, if you're willing, about what the Lord's Supper has meant to you. Anyone? Go ahead. Uh, you know, the Lord's Supper uh, really had such a great meaning for me because I grew up in the church and uh, I was in the Sunday school and we were taught about the Lord's Supper and when we could take it. And uh, I just wanted to uh, be able to take it. And once I was baptized into the church, I felt like I was, I had arrived because then I was able to partake of the Lord's Supper. And it just meant so much to me. And you know, it still means so much to me today. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister. Sister Audrey, go ahead. Uh, I uh, remember the Lord's Supper as a special uh, reverence uh, service that we perform. It takes me back to actually when we do the service to visualize Christ with the disciples and them sitting around the table and he's talking to them. 
And it just puts me in that spiritual mode uh, when I am doing um, the Last Supper and all the services which we're going to be discussing in the lesson uh, that goes along with the Lord's Supper. Amen. Thank you, Sister Audrey. Sister Gladys. Um, the Lord's Supper reminds me that um, the Messiah is coming back. Mm. Um, in Corinthians, it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim his death until he comes. And he's coming back in great power and in great glory. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And all this foolishness that we're going through is going to be over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister Parker. I remember, you know, we were taught that the Lord's Supper was special and it was holy and that there is healing during the Lord's Supper. By your faith, you can be healed. Mm. Yeah, we were, we were taught what? that. But it's by your faith, believing in the death of Christ and what Christ did for you. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have some more comments later on, but right now we're going to finish the introduction. Uh, Sister Regina, if you can continue, please. This ordinance goes beyond symbolizing pardon for whatever sin a person may have committed. In addition to confessing one's sin to God and to any others he may have injured, it involves asking God for help to change gain victory and become more like Jesus. It's a service rich in symbolism that over the centuries has been a helpful way to pass on basic spiritual truth. Some churches have put a literal interpretation on Jesus' words. This is my body and this is my blood. But Adventists interpret them figuratively figuratively yes often stated other truths symbolically such as i am the gate john 10 7 but obviously he did not mean that he was literally a gate similarly the unleavened bread and the unfermented wine are symbols of the bo broken body and blood Partip participation in these symbols is an expression of faith in him as savior from our sins and of the union of his life with ours. Since the final days of the 1840s, Seventh-day Adventists have celebrated the Lord's Supper four times a year at the end of each quarter. A typical service is conducted in the following manner. All right, so before we get to the next section, uh, let's, if, if, if anybody wants to speak on this, uh, some churches have communion once a month. Why do Adventists have it once a quarter? Good question. Does anybody know? Yeah. Remember the Lord said as often, you can do it as much as you like, right? But we have it once a quarter instead of once a month, like some churches do. Uh, if uh, I can answer the question, is to maintain the significance of it, to keep it important. We found that when we had it too often, it was just another day. But when you have it once a quarter, it's not too long between communions, but it's not too frequent either. What do y'all think of that? I love it. it. It follows right in line with putting emphasis on it and make sure that we have a desire rather than just being there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Brother King, man. Uh, Brother Parker. I was thinking uh, the same with the answer that you gave about it being not so frequent because when you do it too often it just becomes a tradition instead of a memorial mm. because a memorial means that you are really remembering someone but a tradition is something that you do because that's the way it is and i agree with the 
once a quarter because it makes it more effective and more of looking forward to instead of saying, oh, well, we're going to have communion. This is the fourth Sunday, it's the fourth Sabbath. We're going to have communion today. I got to get ready for communion. But when it comes down to quarterly, you anticipate it, you look forward to it, and you're excited about it. Amen. Amen. Sister Audrey, then Dr. Pan. Uh, I can see this more sacredness by doing it quarterly and that it, it gives you that spiritualness and uh, the thing of part of it is to look at your sins that you're confessing and also it speaks about if you've had aught with your brother or sister mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to cover that and to ask for forgiveness or make amends to whatever the situation is, it makes it more personal and it gives us a opportunity to come before the Lord and ask forgiveness of our sins. Beautiful, beautiful, Dr. Pan. Well, since uh, you said that Jesus said, do this as often as you like and remember us of me, uh, I think either way is, is okay. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. So if if they somebody wants to do it once a month or once a quarter, uh, that's a decision that they've made in the church. Um, but I think either way is okay, and it shouldn't take away the significance of it because if you really know what communion is about, then it will be holy no matter how often it's done. Yes, yes, and, and, and I'm glad you said that. It's not saying that others are wrong. It's just, we're just simply fleshing out why we do it the way that we do it. It's a, a matter of making sure that is significant, not saying that others aren't. Uh, I think that uh, each pastor and each leadership team should take the temperature of their church. If they see people are kind of beginning to get sloppy with it, there are times where I've stretched it out even longer when I saw that people weren't preparing the way that they should for the sacredness of it, uh, that we would, uh, you know, even practice to, to go through it as leaders to make sure that we give it the reverence that it deserves. But that is an excellent point that there's no wrong way to do it as long as the reverence is there. Brother Mike. The other reason, the other thing I was thinking about is why every 90 days or whenever the, with the stretch is it gives them more appreciation for our family members to get together as the church meaning you know we we appreciate each other more and and we come closer to god with everybody yes sir yes sir well said thank you thank you all right let's go on to Talk about foot washing. Brother King, man, you still there? Yes, I am. All right. You can take over now, sir, in section two, Deacon King, man. Following a short sermon by the pastor, the men and women separate it and go to different rooms in the church for service of foot washing. This rite represents cleansing from sin. John the 13th chapter verse one through 17. While there is no particular merit in the act itself, it provides the participants with an opportunity to both before and during the service to settle their differences and confess their faults to each other. It symbolizes cleansing from sins committed during participants walk along the Christian pathway. The foot washing service also symbolizes their renewed dedication to the service of Christ. One must put away pride in order to kneel and wash the feet of a brother or sister who is a member of the same church. This is one of the things it means to serve Jesus with the whole heart, because this ceremony emphasizes the spirit of Christian fellowship, it is appropriate preparation for participation in the Lord's Supper. 
All right. All right. Well, Saints, um, as you know, many churches are not continuing this tradition of foot washing. Uh, what are your thoughts on foot washing? And Brother Kingman, since you read, if you have something, we can start with you. Sure, do have something. Mm -hmm. I am quickly moved to the point before I, I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I never knew that fish washing was a part of participation for taking communion. And at first, I didn't want anyone to touch my feet or wash my feet. And basically, as a cover-up, I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But as I thought about it, it moved me on a different plane to say Jesus uh, feet was washed and he washed others first to put the significance that he as a prestigious Lord was not so hype as we could say high up in status that he couldn't humble himself to wash his disciples. So now that some churches or some groups are dissolving not to do this anymore, it may be because of the pandemic, I think what you might have been indicating or they never did include it the significance of it is it's a, it's a humbleness. We come to church to get healed, not to get sick. Mm. So the spirit oh, of the man. Lord is upon us. That Hold the on, healing brother, is man, I need to write that down. We come to church to get healed, not to get sick. I think I'm going to quote you on that one. Go ahead. Uh, and that's basically <laughs> how I move now. It, I'm honored. And I can just say, well, hey, allow me to return the compliment by washing your feet. And it's such a great emphasis that the spirit of the Lord is up on the foot washing service as well as the communion itself. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Brother Mike. Mike? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, the first time I did this, with with the foot washing i was kind of embarrassed because i i know i got stinky feet <laughs> <laughs> so you know to me it was kind of embarrassing at first and it was actually the first and only time i've done it so far and you know i kind of miss it now because hmm. you know it's, it's exactly what it says it's a time for us to get together and appreciate each other and you know it, if we're doing something wrong to each other, we confess it to each other. I mean, it, it was a great thing. It was a blessing to me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Sister Donna. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's um, a very impart, important part <clears throat> of, um, uh, of the service when we do the Lord's Supper. It, um, and that's the purpose of it, I think. It, it, it humiliates on both sides on both ends of the spectrum, you know, both the one who's washing their feet and the ones whose feet are getting washed. And um, I believe that the master ordained it um, to signify renewal, cleansing, and to express a willingness to serve one another in a Christ-like humility and to unite our hearts in love. So I think that um, it's a very, very important part of it um, because it is open to all believing Christians and you never know what you might get when them people take off their shoes. So it's a reason for all of that, I believe. Amen. Thank you, Sister Donna. Uh, Sister Audrey. I look at it also as part of like a mini baptism. You know, we get in, we get in the water with our whole body, but this, is, and that's part of the cleansing too, and making a dedication and, and recommitment to the Lord. Uh, and I look at the foot washing part as a mini uh, cleansing and making a recommitment to the service of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sister Audrey. Uh, Elder Pam. Oh, I love foot washing. It's wonderful. Uh, we sing and we pray in addition to the foot washing, but uh, Jesus Christ is our example. And he said foot washing, he did foot washing as an example and we're to follow his example. And that's one example I enjoy following among many or all of them. Amen, thank you so much. I think we got it even split right down the middle. The men were a little hesitant. That includes me. I got combat feet. 
from actual combat. I probably should be on 100% disability with these uh, eagle claws. <laughs> However, uh, it is a wonderful thing and I enjoy it. Sister Barbara. Uh, Pastor, you know, I uh, once was young and now I'm old. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, uh, it was just nothing to get down and uh, wash the feet of uh, the sisters. But when you get older, and you have to, uh, you know, you don't get down. You sit in the chair and uh, <laughs> you have to be very inventive. And so it just, but, but, the, but, the, but the effect is still the same. Yes, you know? indeed. And, and I just love it. Yes, amen, amen. All right. Thank you so much, Sister Gladys. Uh, I was going to say, you know, back in the Bible days, it was dirty and dusty and their sandals. They probably walked in a lot of manure and um, a lot of stuff that I think the, the, the servants were the ones who did the foot washing. And the peers probably didn't wash each other's feet. And I believe it was a humbling, a very humbling experience for, for the Messiah to wash the disciples feet and I believe they were shocked when he did that and for us to continue mm -hmm. that one today is a humbling experience for us and lets us know that you know it brings us down to a level of, 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 of being with each other not higher than each other or better than each other right. it, it's a form of I think it just unifies us yes beautiful beautiful brother Parker and it on top of that, I believe it's a signal of humility also mm. to wash someone's feet because Jesus made the statement that, you know, we are to be servants one to another because when Jesus was getting ready to wash Peter's feet, Peter said, no, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. And Jesus explained to him, if you don't want me to do this, you will have no part of me. And Peter's mm. response was not just my feet, but my head, my hands, everything. So mm. we need to be um, servants one to another and to others, not just to those of the household of faith, but to others also. And I believe that's why foot washing is very important to keep us in that humble frame of mind. Yes, sir. You know, I was watching John Loma Cain, uh this morning uh, talking about last day events and um, you know, I just find it so sad that this is one of the things that people uh, sometimes state when they want to call us a cult, even though it was Jesus who instituted it. And uh, what John Loma came was talking about was that how much people will believe when they don't read their Bible. You can get people to believe just about anything. For instance, uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan is six letters for each word, 666. So he was the Antichrist. The world was coming to an end because <laughs> of uh, Ronald Reagan's name. Then there was 13 stars on the side of Procter and Gamble's uh, products. So that was it. That was the mark of the, you know, and, and when it comes to us, uh, the things that people cite as reasons for being a cult are just not valid. Uh, number one, as we talked about talking about on Wednesday night now, uh, we have a prophet. Oh man, that's a sign of a cult. No, it's not. It's a sign that God is with you. Uh, then the other one is we wash feet. We do that strange act. We, are, we won't accept Jesus Christ's death on the cross because we're doing things that Jews did. And um, it's just clear that when people make these kinds of accusations, they're not reading the Bible. And in my younger days, I cuss folks out. I don't mind telling you because God delivered me. <laughs> but now I use little things to provoke thought. How can washing your brother's feet harm them? And nobody can answer that question. How can it harm them? And then when they don't have an answer, I ask, how can it help them and how can it help you? All right, so we're going to go on now. Uh, 
Let's see, Brother King, man. You, oh, wait a minute, Sister Donna, go ahead. I just wanted to say one last thing that not only um, do, do you go through that humiliation, um, both the washer and the washee at the time that it's happening, but you you don't forget that, you know? <laughs> you think about that for, for days afterwards, you know? I washed his feet or they washed my feet. You know, you don't forget that. That humility stays with you. Amen, amen. All right, all right. This is a short lesson. So uh, let's see if we can get somebody else to read now. I'll take it on. All right, thank you, Brother Parker. Following the foot washing service, the church members return to the sanctuary. The pastor and elders come to the communion table, remove the cloth that covers the bread and wine and read an appropriate passage of scriptures such as 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Mm -hmm. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Me. Following a short prayer, the elders break the communion bread into smaller pieces and the deacons distribute it to the congregation. Again, following the reading of a text of scripture, such as 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26, the elders and deacons follow a similar procedure with the unfermented wine. All right, okay, so we're coming down. The third section is very short. So um, let's talk about this um, because I know that sometimes People haven't seen this in a grand style until they come into a church like ours. You know, we don't uh, hold back. We pull out all the stops, right, to, <laughs> to make this really nice. And me personally, even though they have the modern technology, I still like a sheet of unleavened bread to break it. When it's really quiet uh, in the sanctuary, you can hear that bread breaking. Uh, has anyone heard that? Anybody, anybody experienced that? Uh, Brother Mike? Yes. Sure. Yeah. So what does that do? I have too, Pastor. All right. All right. What, what, uh, you know, just briefly someone, uh, when you see the officers of the church dressed the same and they're standing behind that table, the deaconess are uh, sitting together, the deacons are in position, uh, and you see the, the tears of wine or grape juice, to be clear, uh, in their containers and the bread there. Uh, what does that do to you? I got to say, it makes me appreciate appreciate what all God and Jesus has done for us. Amen. Amen. Any, anyone else? Uh, it Don? puts me into a reverential state of mind. Amen. Amen. Sister Donna, go ahead. Well, it um, actually uh, drove home in me the fact that, um, that as we partake, um, that, that, that we are joyfully proclaiming um, the Lord's death until he comes again, um, that we are accepting of, of what he did for us in the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood. Yes, indeed. Elder Pan. Well, what it does for me, I get pretty emotional, especially when I look out at the rest of the congregants and realize that we are the body of Christ. And that we, in our own brokenness, that all of us have some brokenness, and that Jesus Christ's body was broken also for us. Mm. And that he has shared in our own humanity by having his own body broken. And that it makes me realize our brokenness and what he has done 
to help us be healed from that brokenness. So I get real emotional. It's a very solemn occasion. It's really beautiful when you watch the congregants and all of us partake of the bread and of the wine all at the same time as the body of Christ. Yes, indeed. Sister Parker. You know, listen to everybody. It puts me in a mind of being humble. And just, you know, as everyone said, thinking about what Christ had done for us. And when we go to heaven, we all go gather together and have, you know, break bread. Praise God with our Lord and our Savior. But the thing is, while we on this earth, we still have an opportunity to serve the Lord. Praise God. And this is really, a, you know, it's like going better than going to a White House supper or anything like this. This is the greatest thing that we could do is to come together and just serve, you know, serve each other through the feet washing and then have, come back and uh, break bread together. But I look at some churches, they you they all drink out the same cup. Yeah, that, uh, no. Nah. <laughs> you <know>. And uh, <laughs> I don't think that's a good thing to be doing, you know. No, not back, today, no, not today. <laughs> Parker, cut it out. <laughs> Brother King, <Kim, man. laughs> yeah, the, the um, the, the symbolism, the, the symbolism, and the significance of it especially when you had the opportunity to hear the breaking of the pieces. It's almost like the breaking of the bones of Christ mm -hmm. in a symbolized way that he, this is my body. Mm -hmm. And that the only way you can get it is to break it apart. Yes. And I also get all emotional and tears be running down my, my, my face. And I'll be looking for a bigger piece rather than something small. I want to get a nice size so that it can carry me through to the next time. Yes, sir. We call you Peter, huh? Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Sister Donna. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you mentioned about um, the breaking of that single sheet of unleavened bread, mm -hmm. when it was very quiet, just to watch that um, and to see it snap, you know, it, 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 reminds me of how Jesus instituted this as a celebration at the Last Supper. He knew what was about to happen, okay? Mm -hmm. But he tells us to celebrate it. To me, that's mind blowing, yeah. you know? He knew, he knew what was about to, what he was about to go through, every last bit of it. And he tells us to celebrate it. And, and that's why we need to be doing that to the fullest. I know that's right, amen. Amen, Sister Regina. Yes, it symbolizes to me fellowship and a unified front from that day uh, that he did sit with his disciples and they they uh, did this unified uh, uh, ordinance. Now to this day, what that's what makes it so much more symbolic to me. These many um, years later and centuries and whatever later, we're still carrying out this unified symbolic fellowship. And uh, uh, Galatians 5.13 says, through love, serve one another. So we are honoring Christ even to this day. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Stone. Yes, for me, it, it reminds me of when Jesus said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you're not a part of me. Mm. And many of his disciples turned and walked away from him and walked with him no more. But that group, that core group that stayed by understood that he meant his words, his life. Uh, by faith, we receive him into us. And this is an object lesson, the unleavened bread and unfermented juice is an object lesson of us receiving the word of God and it becoming flesh. We're fleshing out or living out the word. Amen, Dr. Pam. 
Yes, and uh, what is interesting, there are some denominations that believe that the bread and the wine actually turns into Jesus' flesh and actual blood. Uh, and they don't see it as being symbolic. They see it as actual changes, uh, particularly the Catholic Church and some other uh, Protestant denominations believe that. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing that they don't call them a cult, huh? But, uh, exactly, no... <laughs> that's cultists. <laughs> yeah, but there's no scriptural support for that. Uh, Sister Gladys. Hi. Um, you know, the unleavened bread was part of the Passover ceremony, and the disciples and the Messiah were in the upper room to celebrate the Passover. But the Messiah took the unleavened bread and the, 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 the blessing of the bread and the, the cup of wine to another level. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were all doing it out of tradition to, um, to represent them coming out of Egypt where they were putting the, the blood over the doorpost of their houses. And what the Messiah did was allowed it to uh, go over the doorpost, the doorpost of our hearts inward. And it took on a deeper symbolic meaning to us and for us. It changed the flavor of that tradition and brought it um, to a deeper and higher meaning. All right. Amen. Thank you. Very good. Deacon Parker. Uh, Brother Parker? Did we lose him? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I was muted still. Okay. Right. Sister Pam made me think about something when she said uh, about the people nowadays believing that the cup and the bread are actually Christ's body. I think the word is transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of weird and peculiar because back in the days when the Romans were in charge, they killed a Christian because they said that they actually ate people and drank their blood. Mm -hmm. Now think about in the modern days, now they're saying this is actually what they're doing. That's how the devil works. You always flip things around to make it weird and bad. Amen, amen. I would love to dive into that, but this is a beginner class, so we're going to keep it light. <laughs> but that is uh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. All right, so let's uh, go on here. Um, I think we, uh, who was reading there? I forgot. It was me. Oh, okay, please continue. In some churches, the deacons distribute the bread and wine together. With both the bread and the wine, the congregation waits to eat or drink until all those present have been served so everyone can participate together. The service concludes with a hymn, perhaps a prayer, and the taking of an offering for the poor. Well, all right. Well, there you have it. Um, before we go into this last brief section, we're gonna get a new reader when we do, uh, but there's the, how Adventists remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The other way that we remember it is through baptism. We've been through that. So those are the two ways um, that we commemorate uh, the forgiveness of our sins, the sacrifice for our sins and the forgiveness of our sins. And also um, have a constant reminder that we're supposed to be a new creature in Christ, uh, communion. Also, as someone stated, I just wanna restate it that the, um, we are washed at that time, just like we're done for baptism, that we, that's why we make amends and we take the time to settle things. You know, it's sort of like the year of Jubilee where all debt is forgiven, but this time is forgiven by God and by our neighbors. You know, if we have aught with one another, these are the days that we're supposed to settle it and carry it no more, no matter who was right or who was wrong whether somebody apologized to us or not, we're supposed to give it to God and move on. And that brings us to, to the reason section three is titled the way that it is, solemn joy. 
All right, who wants to read that for us? I'll read it. Okay, who was that? What voice said that here? Donna. Oh, all right, thank you, ma'am. Go right ahead. On the one hand, the Lord's Supper is a solemn occasion, a time when believers remember that Jesus took upon himself our guilt and died for our sins, Isaiah 53, verse 5. On the other hand, it's an occasion of great rejoicing, for it looks forward to the day when God will make all things new. Beautiful. Amen. Please continue. First, First Corinthians 15, 52 reads, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay. Thank you, Sister Donna. I'm going to call on you in a moment. Uh, this is our last discussion tonight, and um, I believe someone said it. I'm pretty sure somebody did, but we're going to emphasize it now. Communion points forward. You know, we talk about the bread and wine being symbolic of the body and blood of Jesus, but the communion service itself is symbolic of what? What are we looking forward to? And Sister Donna, since you read, you can go first if you like. Um, you say, what are we looking forward to? Yes, when we have this communion celebration together, what are we practicing for? I think we are practicing for the day when we will actually sup with him and he with us, that mm -hmm. he will return for us, a church without spot or wrinkle, and we will be joining with him. And this all is just practice, I believe. Yes. Uh, any, any, I was about to jump in. You almost tempted me, Sister Donna. I can't do it. I got to let people talk because that was good. Anybody else want to add to it? I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Go, go right ahead if you want to add to that. Okay, everybody's quiet, so I'm going to jump in. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the sacrifice of animals and the shedding of blood and even the annual uh, reconciliation that takes place, what took place in the most holy place was all a foreshadowing of when the real sacrifice would be made when Jesus came. Likewise, the taking of bread and wine, the way that we do now is real. It is us coming in and asking for forgiveness of sins and also forgiving others. But one day, there won't be any sin to be forgiven. Lord have mercy. One day, we won't have to wrestle with sin anymore. Does anybody want to take it from there? Because I'll take the whole thing. So I want y'all to come in. But foreshadowing, looking forward, as she said, uh, as Sister Donna said, we're going to sit at the welcome table with Jesus, but our status will be different. What will be our status then? Nobody want to talk about it? Okay. All right. I think we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Yes, we, right in front of you. This, 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 <laughs> this, 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 this mortality will become immortality. And oh my goodness. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, the fight of sin will be over. Jesus will make good on the final promise that he gave us. That, that sin and death will actually die. Any thoughts about that? Anybody looking forward to that? Yes, yes. Okay, everybody's quiet. This I am. I'm looking forward to it, Pastor. I am too, Pastor. <laughs> when I, you know, when I think about it, every trial we go through, one day mm. it will all come to an end. Praise mm -hmm. God. And my mansion that's in heaven, Praise God, I would have re been rewarded for the life that I lived on this earth. And I kept the faith. Do it all. I kept the faith. Mm. I found without a spot or wrinkle. Glory, hallelujah. And that's going to cost us something. Woo -wee. That's going to cost us something. My, 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 what are we going to do now? Oh, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. If we just hold on a little while longer. Mm, mm, mm. Everything go come to full volition for us. 
and praise God. And God go open up the skies. They, they said he go pull back like a curtain and he go step down and he go say, hey, come up hither. And that's going to be you and me. Never again to come back on this earth and live a life that we live in now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, it is worth it all. I don't care what we go through, it is worth it all. The book, oh my goodness, Sister Stone, my, 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 your house be next to mine. I can see you <laughs> Hallelujah. So I was just thinking this, even if you live to be 100 years old on yes. this earth, and you get a big celebration about being a, a centurion and all of this stuff. It won't matter compared with the eons of eternity that we'll be living righteous and holy and immortal. Oh yes, no matter, no matter what we're going through here, it we will say, Sister Whito said that we will say heaven was cheap enough. Amen, amen. Because amen. our Savior has, has really paid the full price. Yes. He has really paid the full price. We're not paying anything. That's right, Sister, Sister Audrey, come on in. I just want to say that each and every time that we do communion, it puts us in a mind frame that, as you say, a shadow of what to come. Mm -hmm. It puts us in a mind frame and a mindset that we're inching closer and closer to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we do communion, you can come into that uh, type of spirituality and reverence, and it becomes more alive to you and a part of you, and you uh, become and have more of a closer relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, yes. All right, y'all give me all up. Speaking King Man, go right ahead, hey, Brother Mike. Yes, the um, opportunity to share with this expression of my mic, I could not get my my uh, mic unmuted. I'm sitting over here rapping and saying, come on, come on, come on. So excited to participate in that answer. I wasn't being quiet. I said, this devil is messing with my system. Mm. But um, that overcome over over oh, the desire got stronger and stronger to the Lord. So we got it. We got him out of your way. Go ahead and speak. The joy of it all is that time will not exist, and we will just be glory, hallelujah, praising for our transformation to be with God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and all the rest of the saints. And this is so wonderful that we have this pre-information about the sanctuary and about our eternal home. And like some of us were just saying, my room will be next to yours and I'll be a hundred years old and, or possible. It's just great to have the desire to do the right thing, to have the experience of eternity with God, with the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. That's what excites me. And I'm just thankful to all of you and the lesson that you're bringing to us, Pastor, and Fresh Start. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother yes. Mike and then Dr. Pan. Yeah, I got to say, you know, it would it's going to be uh, one of the most blessing days. No more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, no more tears, no, no more none of that. It's just going to be praise. It's going to be hallelujah. That that's going to be one of the best days and the only day I'll ever remember. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother, Dr. Pam. Well, several things come to my mind, and one of the first things is uh, when we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the jubilee and the. Other one that I really, really love is we shall behold him. The sky shall unfold, preparing his interest. The stars will applaud him with thunders of praise, and we shall behold him as he is. And what is also really, really important, 
we'll see him face to face in all of his glory. We shall behold him face to face, our Lord and Savior. And, and we also will have a glorified body just like him. We will be changed. We won't be broken anymore. We shall be whole and we'll be just like Jesus with a glorified body. And that I cannot wait for. And we'll be shouting and singing the Jubilee. And those are that's the that's the blessed hope that we hold out for, that we keep the faith for, that we keep on that narrow road for. Mm. And uh, it's so good to have other people that we know, like everybody on this line is going to be there also. Our sisters, our brothers who died in Christ will be there also. So yes, it's, it's very exciting. And it helps you to keep on holding on in this world. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, uh, Deacon Parker. And then we're gonna have to go ahead and head to a close. I'm not gonna be long, Sister Pam stole my thunder. I oh. should not have waited because when everybody was talking, that song came into my mind. We shall behold him face to face. So I'm not going to even delay time because she took it from me. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, that we'll have plenty of time to discuss many other things, but this was a wonderful wonderful lesson. Uh, I just wanted to show you this because I thought that it was so cool. Mm -hmm. um, That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just this is the kind of thing um, that reminds us that no one is going to be in heaven that doesn't want to be there. You know, Pastor, um, can I just say one last thing? Sure. You know, when we do Holy Communion, I think all of that, like we've already said that it's practice, okay? So I think what we as God's children should really be trying to do is to be in that mind every day. You know, when we pick it up on, on communion day, don't just be that way for that day. Try to be that way all the time in that frame of mind, you know, being forgiving, you know, trying to straighten out any, 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 any problems that you might have with another brother or sister. You know, I, I, think, I think that's called having the mind of Christ. And we need to make it a way of life instead of just a communion day special. Hmm. All right. Amen. All right. All right. Any any thoughts on that? I gotta say, is you right? We need to be like that every day, not just one day. Hmm. Every day. Mm -hmm. And what a day that would be with that picture. Yeah. If you look to the top of it, you know. It reminds you of a text that uh, John saw a number that no man could count. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So God is not uh, our enemy. He's not Santa Claus making a list of all your wrongs so he can disqualify you. Uh, he is looking uh, for as many as possible to take home with him. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, this is a good place to, to start to bring this uh, to a close. Uh, I've again forgot who was reading, <laughs> but uh, we only have a couple of pages left. And, it was me. Uh, oh, it took, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Solemn Joy. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And we will sit down with Jesus, our Redeemer, at the great supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 9. Yeah, so the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is uh, more 
than a routine. Uh, it is an act of faith. It is believing not only that Jesus died, but believing that he lives to ever make intercession for us. And uh, it's certainly worthy of further study. Uh, in addition to the text that uh, the panel gave you tonight, if you are watching, uh, here are some more scriptures where you can look more into it uh, because it really is a beautiful way to learn the depth of Christ's sacrifice for us all. Um, before you dismiss it, um, you know, I, I would invite all who are watching to look into this and then pray and ask God, uh, what does this mean to me? And I believe that God will reveal that to you. All right, on next week, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, it'll be lesson 17. And we look forward to all of you being there. Okay, let's pray once again, and we're going to close. Lord, thank you for the time that we've spent talking about the Lord's Supper. And my prayer, Lord, is that all who are listening, all who are watching, will be joined with a body of believers uh, and become a Christian if they're not, and then participate in a right that Christ instituted himself to all believers. We thank you for all that you've done for us, the forgiveness of our sins, and we look forward to the day where sin and death and pain and suffering will be no more. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We want to thank you all for...